I've never worried about performing to the level that somebody else has for me. It's never been a concern to me because my standards for myself will always be far higher than anybody else's standards for me. And so when I say it's that fear of, of being irrelevant, what does that really look like? How can we affect people's lives for a posit- in a positive way? How can we be a part of the generation, a part of the conversation that takes what we have here and at least relentlessly tries to make it better? Yeah. Will we make a difference? Well, I hope so. I hope so. I hope so. But you're going to try, though. But at least relentlessly tries. They're pursuing it. They're pursuing it. Yeah. And that's what that, what that fear really comes from and is, and is rooted in. And I'm not convinced when you say that fear is a good thing, I'm not convinced that that's not a wonderful thing. Yeah. Because that fear is going to drive me to continue to try to make a difference. I have a fear of not knowing something. I have a fear of not being in good shape. So I have a fear of not knowing something. So I, I'm constantly researching stuff, as are you. We talk about yeah. this how many times a day. Yeah. I have a fear of not being in good shape. So I work out every day. Every day? Every day. Forever, ever? Forever, ever? <laughs> every day. And so do you. You have created quite a pretty good golf game. Went to the driver with you a few months ago, and I was thoroughly impressed considering that we didn't grow up playing a lot of golf. But but you had a fear of sucking at it. Oh, yeah. So you made sure that you got good at it and you were relentless and getting pretty doggone good at it. All of this stuff is driven, and I feel like, what is a healthy fear. And I think we got to define that because that's what, when you say fear is wonderful, that is absolutely wonderful if it's driving you to do those things. Where fear becomes dangerous and detrimental is when it paralyzes you from doing anything. Like, I am so scared of something that I don't even want to try it. Yeah. What I love about our parents growing up is that a lot of young kids, a lot of young people, you see they have like a fear of certain foods. Or somebody will always tell me, like, as an adult, I don't eat that. Well, have you tried it? I don't know. Well, how you know? What are you twelve? How do you know you don't even like it? You know, when I talk to people, like I don't eat this, I'm like, dude. Yeah, a good a good buddy of mine, like, <laughs> like what's wrong e- with eats you? like a eats like a seven year old. You know, it's like <laughs> you, you you'll go to a sandwich shop and it's like, yeah, I don't want any of the the the, the, the white stuff. You mean mayonnaise? Yeah, man, come on, like quit quit being a four year old. Like the condiments are okay. Don't be scared of it. Yeah. What I love about our parents was that if you recall, no matter what was on our plate, we had to try. Everything. Try. She has to finish everything. <laughs> <laughs> Try. <laughs> Remember beets? Yes. So, so you. So that's what's weird. Like it's you, crazy. You yeah. seem to think beets are okay. They're now. good now. I. I'm. Brenda, they're they're good now. I'm I will, scarred. I will go to it. I will go to a restaurant and order a beet salad now. But here's here's what's funny. It doesn't mean that I won't eat beets if they're the vegetable that's placed a, a, in front of me. On my plate. Now, once again, that's healthy habits, right? Yeah. We grew up in a house where you had a vegetable. Every meal. Every meal. And in a house where if I order something and it has beets on it, well, I'm going to eat those beets and I'm not going to like them very much. But hey, I I ordered it. You're going to eat it. I ordered it. Remember, my mom used to make us eat that. But it wasn't the beets like in a beet salad. Yeah. It was like... Like, was it, it? Can you have canned beets? No, canned beets. They, were they canned beets? I think so. And they, they, they were in that just bitter juice. Yeah. Terrible. And my mom, my mom would just sit there and say, you want to sit down and eat it now. Eat this now. Oh, man. <laughs> but that was fear. So, you, so we were scared of, we were fearful of mom. <laughs> <laughs> just choking, this choking, choking down, down beasts. beasts. <laughs> <laughs> but aren't you glad, though? Yeah. Yeah. Aren't you glad? Because we grew up being these adults that, like... I could pretty, we can pretty much eat anything and everything. Why? Because everything was introduced to us at a young age because we didn't have any fear of it. It's a broader metaphor, though, Wesley. It's the fear of trying. Yeah. 
of trying anything. anything. Right? I mean, a, a couple of months back, and you, you want to talk about fear. A couple of months back, my buddy Will reached out and said, hey, man, do you want to go spear fishing in Puerto Rico? First of all, I mean, that sentence is just incredible, right? Like, yeah. hey, man, you want to spearfish in Puerto Rico? He does it all the time, too. It's yeah. like no big deal. Yeah. He says it on a casually nonchalant. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, yeah, sure. It's, 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 like, it's like, hey, do you want to put on a squirrel suit and go to and go to the Alps and, ju- and jump off mountains? He's <laughs> like, okay, yeah, whatever. Yeah, whatever, man. But he says it like, like, oh, yeah, I do it all. I do it every, I do it every, all the time. The crazy thing was, as first of all, there's the inherent fears of that ask. Pre-COVID and everything, I probably wouldn't have gone because I always fear being away from my kids because there's a sense of guilt that I have, that I'm not with them. I'm not hanging out with them. I'm not spending time with the family. Like, there's this there is? sense of guilt. Yeah. You were right. Yeah, I know. I thought she got, <laughs> I got to get away. Puerto Rico. Can get I, my ticket. Can, 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 can you leave in an hour? Get, get my ticket. <laughs> so there's always that fear. And, and fortunately... Love right. Waddell was very supportive. She said, yeah, this isn't something you would normally do. It sounds like it'd be a whole lot of fun. Go ahead and do it. So we go down there, have just a, a wonderful trip uh, spearfishing. It was fantastic. But I am deathly afraid of sharks. It's reasonable. And I think it's, I think it's rational it's not unreasonable. to be it's afraid not, of sharks. It's not unreasonable. Okay. So when you spearfish... There's this flasher See that Jaws that you they, yeah I, I grew up we grew up on Jaws right yeah so when you spearfish there's these flashers that you throw into the water okay and when fish see the flashers they're attracted to them so you throw in the flasher the fish will see it and then you just you plug them with this with this spear yeah. it's real messed up right like you know they're like oh look it's a I think that know, sounds kind of awesome it's, it's really messed up I'm de- I like that kind of whole stuff. lot of fun yeah. though right <laughs> so put the flasher in and we're we're out the first day and and uh my buddy will shot a wahoo like had a really good you know good day the first day second day we're out there and we go to a different part of the ocean right put the flasher down we're all in the water and i see this bull shark swim up to the flasher and you know how how in the cartoons when like their eyes these cartoon out. their <laughs> eyes pop out yeah. and you see them swim their legs are just flying out man i saw that shark and i swam back to that boat faster than i've ever swam in my entire <laughs> life and jumped up in the boat and they're cracking up because everybody else is staying down there they're like hey don't bother it you know yes, we'll be fine yeah, yada, yeah, yada, 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 okay yeah. yeah so we move on we go to another spot and have another drop right okay drop in get down there and I'm with our guide. It's not one bull shark this time. There's three bull okay. sharks. And they are huge. Okay? And so they're swimming around. They're playing with the flasher. They, they, at one point, this shark was like seven, eight feet away from me. In the water, right? Like yeah. He closes on me. It's over. And most attacks, of course, happen from bull sharks. And I'm about to swim away. And the guy just grabs my arm and he looks at me and he just nods his head. You know, it's okay. You'll be fine. And I stayed there. And the sharks were swimming around, swimming around, swimming around, swimming around. And we were there with the sharks for probably 10 minutes. That's awesome. Then we had another drop after that. Yeah. Two more bull sharks. Dude, that's awesome. And I stayed there and we were there. And after it was all said and done, it was so funny because our guide, I mean, this is this is somebody who spearfishes all around the world all the time. And we were just chumming it up afterwards. And he's just like, he's like, man, he's like, I'm just really proud of you, man. It's like, that's really hard to, to, to overcome, overcome and face your fear. Fears. And, and, and what, is that, what does that feel like? And it was just one of those moments where you really think, I mean, look, I wouldn't advise people jump in shark infested water and, and swim around. Of course not. Uh, but it was really one of those moments where you think about all the different pieces of that infrastructure, being around somebody who I trusted and I trusted to look after me, right? Being in a position where there's an air of safety, but there's an air of nuance and different too. 
because oftentimes that's what we fear. We fear what is different. But after every time in my life when I've been able to overcome something that I feared, I've always felt this great relief because it no longer owns you. But also, I just think you're a wuss. <laughs> Period. I think you're a wuss. Great story. I think you're a wuss. Here's why I think you're a wuss. Because, because when I learned how to scuba dive when I was in Saudi Arabia, and I learned how to scuba dive in the Red Sea. there's a w- lot of water in Saudi Arabia. I'm just joking. <laughs> Called the Red Sea. When I learned how to scuba dive in the desert. In Jeddah. It was in Jeddah. It was in Jeddah. It was also on the coast. It's right there in the Red Sea. Gotcha. And when I saw a bull shark, I would have been petted. I'm just kidding. No, yeah. I, no I didn't. No, I, I almost soiled myself. <laughs> Me too. I didn't see a shark. Yeah. I almost no, no, soiled myself, no. man. Oh, uh, no. I'm just kidding. But it was, I, I tell you, it was it was really interesting to, to, to confront that and That's think awesome about story, what that means from a, from a fear standpoint. And a lot of times, too, it, it goes back to the idea of, are the things that we do motivated by fear or are they motivated by something else? Because to your point, when does fear become bad? Fear becomes bad when it's completely driving every action. Yeah, that's true. Fear can't drive everything. When, when, when fear is the captain of the ship, you're in trouble. But, you know, comfort alleviates fear. It does. So when you're doing something that's in your comfort zone, you don't really have to necessarily ex- ex- expand that fear profile. Yeah. So this is where I think fear is healthy if it's used as a motivator to expand your comfort profile. Sure. It's almost like a marginal argument here. It's on the margins. And so the one thing I'm always really big on, especially with our with our kids, and you you fortunately have a fearless child. I mean, right is <laughs> how is that fortunate? <laughs> That's a good. That's a good point. Yeah, that's a good point. You yeah. fortunately have a wild animal in your house. <laughs> I was gonna say rabbit, but wild. <laughs> I don't want my children to say I'm scared of anything. I don't want it. I don't want it. I want. I want you to confront your fears. I want you to have a rational understanding as to why you may or you may or may not like something. But to approach everything just being scared is dangerous yeah. because life is scary. Your entire life, you are going to be put in a position where you have to approach something that you're not comfortable with. And for those people that aren't comfortable and they flee from their fears, they'll be running forever. Yeah. I look, I look at how much Jeff Bezos, Jeff Bezos is worth right now. Okay, have you, have you seen the story about the beginning of Amazon? Yeah. Was that fearful? <laughs> yeah. No, th- I mean he's wildly successful. I know that's like that's like an easy example, like Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk and but but we see all these guys and what they are doing, they they are practitioners in overcoming their fears, driving through it and being successful about it. Yeah. They, th- that's what they do for a living. Yeah. Some of the best politicians, some of the best businessmen, some of the best athletes that we see, they are practitioners in facing their fears and overcoming them without relent. Michael Jordan, you know, I'm a big Michael Jordan fan. In the 80s, he just he, he, he couldn't get past the Pistons. Yeah. I mean, how many years was this guy the best player in the NBA? And just and just and every year he came back every year he came back. He was getting beat up by the Pistons. What does he do? I'm going to hit the weight room. Yeah. I'm going to put on 15 pounds of muscle so I don't get beat up anymore. You, you see, he didn't say, oh, shucks, I can't, I can't do it. I'm out. He kept going. He kept pushing. He kept pushing. And eventually he got over the hump. And then next thing you know, fear of – this wasn't even about fear of winning the championship. This was about <laughs> I better win. But it wasn't always like that. Yeah. And I think that's a very valuable lesson for all of us. What 55 combat air missions in Baghdad, the first one was rough. The 55th one was not. You know why that is, don't you? Why? Because fear is about control. Yeah. Okay. 
when I was down there with the sharks, you had no control. I was afraid because I didn't have control of the situation. There you go. Because I knew that one of them things could turn on me, and there was absolutely nothing, you could do. nothing I could do. Right. And overcoming fear isn't necessarily gaining control. It's accepting the fact that you don't have control. I'll take it one step further. And you can only control what you can't control. Yes. You can't control what the shark is going to do, but you can't control how you respond to it. Exactly. And this is this is this is faith, <sighs> yeah, right? Yeah. Like th- this is this is the story you know, in in my Christian view of the world, and it becomes really interesting because it becomes a, a an interesting conversation that I oftentimes have about the power of prayer, and 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 that being a colloquialism that oftentimes we use in faith, and. Me as somebody who holds my faith strong, I'm not as as, as big of an adopter of the idea of the power of faith uh, of prayer. I'm a big adopter of the power of God, right? Because here's what happens: we love to believe that we have control. So if I, in my human view of things, say I think that things should be this way, this way, and this way, then if I think things should be that way, then then I have control of the situation. Well, if I have control of the situation and I want to manipulate it in that way, man, isn't that taking control away from God who can see it all? Like, isn't a, a component of faith being able to understand that you are completely vulnerable, but if you believe in a greater good and a higher power that is there for the best practices and is doing things in the best interest of, of the world, then you can let go of that control that you have. So there's no fear in what that looks like. Faith is oftentimes a coping mechanism of fear too. Absolutely. I think it's a natural human condition to want to look to a higher power for things that can be explained, because if they can't be explained, then you don't have any control. If you have, if you don't have any control, then it goes back to, yeah. There's no atheist in a foxhole. Fear. Huh? No. No. And <laughs> speaking of fear, it's so funny when these random thoughts just come up. Remember that Mark Wahlberg movie, Fear? Vaguely. Yeah, and he's like, it's pretty crazy. He's like stalking this. It's girl. Like back when Mark Wahlberg was Marky Mark. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. The funky bunch. I used to love Mark Wahlberg, but it, it's that he doesn't wear socks either. <laughs> I'm sure he doesn't. <laughs> he's got, he definitely doesn't wear a shirt. <laughs> he's allergic. At least you wear a shirt. He's allergic to cotton. He's allergic to cotton. Is it that he's allergic to cotton? But I, I really do think that that's what we often do. We just want to control every situation so much. And think about it with your kids, right? It's we have this, this, this curated fear of our kids going out and doing their own thing and what if they make bad choices and what if they do this, that, and the other, when in reality, <laughs> we can control the information that we give them, what we expose them to, and the choices that they make beyond that, it's up to them. So sometimes right now I feel like I'm like a bad parent. Sometimes, which is probably most of the time, <laughs> because you know my risk. I have a pretty high my risk tolerance is is. I have a high risk profile. I, I just I just do. I don't mind taking some risks. Yeah. And Emily's is not. <laughs> I mean, everything is careful. Don't look out for it. But it's, it's it's so funny. So like Victoria will do something. She just turned two a couple of weeks ago. So Victoria will do something. That I'm watching, and I'm like, this is not going to end well. Like, like, she's going to fall. It's going to well, be a learning experience. This is going to be, and I just like, if I just you ride, ride you going to fall. If you ride, <laughs> I said, <laughs> if you ride, you're going you gonna to fall. fall. <laughs> and I'm like watching. I'm just like, yeah, yeah. And then, out of like, the abyss is Emily's voice. Careful, Victoria. Careful, don't do that. And like, I wasn't going to say anything. Like, I was going to be like, she's going to learn about this. <laughs> okay, she's going to like this. <laughs> Like, so I do feel like I do feel like, you know, having some fear, like maybe I should probably be a little more di- give a little bit more direction when, when something bad's going to happen. But then part of me is like, this is how people learn to overcome their fears 
by, I don't know, like. Well, to her, it's not a fear. Like, we get these fears conditioned into us, right? That's that's what I don't want her to have that condition in yeah, her. Yeah, I get the, that. That's, but, but, but I will say this. Sometimes maybe she should. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I mean, I'll give you an example. There was a, a spider in the house today, right? And everybody was doing the kabuki dance because there's a, fi- a spider in the house. And it's yeah, like. It's just a spider. It's like, like this big. Why are it's you like, scared of that? That thing is way more afraid of you <laughs> than you are of it. And. And it kind of goes. We're like way bigger than that spider. Yeah. <laughs> and it kind of goes to this idea of of rational versus irrational. And a lot of times, if you read some of these uh, these studies that psychologists will put out on the percentage of things that actually happen that we fear, you know, most of the things that we fear the most never happen. So we spend all of our t- time worrying and opining on things that are never going to happen anyway. Like, how many conversations have you gone into where you're, like, preparing for the complete worst? Like, oh, my gosh, this person's going to blow up. They're going to say this, that, and the other. And then you get into the conversation, and they're like, it never happens. Yeah, okay, bro, cool. Never happens. Like, that that's more the, the norm than it's than, than, than the standard. That's, that's more the standard than it is an aberration of any sort. Yeah. And that, that happens to, to me all the time. So even as we think about, the learned fears that we have and conditioning things. And I, I think about this with my kids all the time. For some reason, there'll be times when my kids think that I'll get mad about stuff, which is really interesting. Like if they spill some water or something like that, like, oh my gosh, I didn't want to tell you because I, I, I thought you'd get really mad. Now, one of the things that I do as a parent, and this isn't necessarily right or wrong, it's the way that I handle things. My goal for the 18 years that my kids are in my house is for them to never see me out of control. Same here. Right? Same here. So my kids have, I have never yelled at my kids. Okay. Uh, I, I, my goal is for them because that's a challenge to me of if I can't be measured and if I can't approach them in a way that, that considers who they are, where they are, and what they're learning, then that's not a failure on their part. It's a failure on my part. I have to take responsibility for my part in that yes, too. I agree. And... The, the irony of that is, even though that's the case, and even though I've never freaked out on my kids about anything, yes, they still have this fear of, well, I spilled that water and I don't want to tell you because you might get mad. And you've never gotten, you've never behaved in a way ever. Where does that come, does that from? come from? It's the human condition. It's not real. It's not founded. Yeah. You've never yelled. In two years, Victoria's only two. Never yelled at her not one time. And don't plan on it. No. Oh. But I guarantee you that if she does something, if she hits Olivia or something, you know what she looks at? Me. Yeah. Like, fearfully. I've never once spanked her, never once, never. Never. But she looks at me just like, I, I, know, I know I did something I should not have been doing. Yeah. It's fascinating. Yeah. So it's, it's this innate recognition yeah. of authority, but then... And, and perhaps that's the journey that, that I've been on that I think is really provocative. There is a recognition of authority that's a level of appropriate that doesn't have to be rooted in fear. Yes. It can be rooted in respect. Fear can, fear can turn into respect. Yeah. A healthy respect. Yeah. Because there's... And that's what, I, what, what I've struggled with so much is when you have people that you feel can are in, it's that authority figure, right? When you have people that you respect their opinion, you respect what they've done, you respect their opinions about you, that's where the fear comes in, in in terms of the idea of, oh my gosh, what if I let those people down? And at some point you make this transition in life and, and, it, and it's freeing because I have recently made this transition you make this transition in life where you realize my life isn't theirs my life is my it's own it's your own life it's your own life like i don't have to fear what, what they think they're, they're going to think what they think and that goes back to the whole idea of, of politics and running for office and putting yourself out there or putting yourself out out there on a podcast or things of, of this sort it gets to the point where you you realize that the fears were really unfounded uh because you don't belong to those people. So I go into this thing fearing failure. 
And what do I do? I lose and I fail. I lose the race. Devastated. You realize it ain't the end. It's not known as it not the end. Running is just the beginning. And my fear has shifted not to fear of failing or losing the next election. The fear of the, the fear of not winning the next election. Hmm. My fear is no longer rooted in rather not I lose. My fear is not being on the congressional full floor helping to make the country better. Yeah. If I'm not doing that in 2022, that's my fear now. Yeah. But I only could only realize that I lost. Yeah. So I had to overcome the fear of losing, and it actually happened. To realize that the old saying is, the only thing to fear is fear itself. It's fear itself. Because it's macro. I mean, once once you understood, you were looking at one very specific piece of it. Yes. Right? You were looking at, at just the election and not the ramifications. Exactly. It's the whole elections have consequences. Exactly. Right? So you're just looking at it from that perspective. And another another fear that I hold is the fear that our children will not be better off than we are because of the country that they're growing up in. Mm -hmm. Huge fear, right? And once again, that fear can, can easily be paralyzing to the point where I just do nothing and I let that control me. Or that fear can be something where you say, hmm, I have a fear of that. What is it that we can do to confront that fear? How can we take accountability right and quite frankly that's a whole nother rabbit hole the fear of accountability people who are just terrified to take accountability for the things that you that, see that it all the time just, just just terrified to actually own up to being flawed there's no fear there's no condemnation in that so this is what i like about the world that we live in today so somebody that does own up to their flaws. Or so not enough up. mint chocolate chip cookies? How'd you guess? <laughs> I'm sorry. Ice cream. <laughs> how'd you know that? So what I don't like about it. How'd you know? How'd you know get ready to say that? <laughs> There's too many types of Girl Scout cookies. <laughs> we only need two. <laughs> uh, it, it's, it's when somebody does own up or somebody does make a mistake, we fillet people today. I mean, we absolutely destroy people. As if we're all perfect. Yeah. And, I mean, you have incoming from everything. Oh. And it's the age-old piece of politics, right? When I would hope that, as a culture, we continue to evolve mm -hmm. and continue to learn more. As a matter of fact, I was reading another book yesterday. I didn't know if you were aware of this. They are now seeing that there were flaws in the way that they— portrayed dinosaurs to us when we were growing up right and of course they have more information yeah they got real interest. dinosaurs did you um, know and this is crazy that so they got the color wrong or? that now some of them like paleontologists are going back and they're saying that that they believe that tyrannosaurus rexes were bright more brightly colored than we've always kind of been conditioned to believe and that some of them could have had feathers on them as well i did see that actually it's crazy, isn't it? I did see that. Like yeah. A T-Rex with, with, with feathers. It's not I mean, a T-Rex. You want to talk about fear. It's not a T-Rex. It's an F-Rex. It's, <laughs> it's a bird Rex. <laughs> not the T-Rex I know. T-Rex I know. Nope. 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 <laughs> Impossible. <laughs> Impossible. Never happened. <laughs> not a T-Rex. Not, not a T-Rex. Not a T-Rex. Sorry, Bubba. <laughs> not a T-Rex. Uh, but I, I think over time. T-Rex with feathers. <laughs> Ain't a T-Rex. What kind of T-Rex is that? Uh, <laughs> more like Big Bird. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the, the, the thing that ends up happening is as we get more information, mm -hmm. as we learn more, as we understand more, we evolve as a culture and we evolve as a people, right? And as that evolution happens within our culture, our fears evolve too. Yes, that's true. You know? And, and there's a piece of, of all of this where just because our fears are evolving doesn't make them founded. 
Yes. It just means you have to adapt to it and understand the times. Yeah. Don't be scared of it. Adapt to it. You know, I hear this I, on the campaign trail. I, I, I heard this a lot. You know, I'm kind of a I'm a Second Amendment guy. I'm a fan of it. Um, for my for for my personal reasons that we have talked about, which will probably be a podcast conversation later on, I'm sure, sure. I'm sure at some point before the sake of time. And, and the argument against uh, you know AR-15s and a bunch of other you know types of weapons is, is the argument of well, when the founding fathers first did this, I guarantee you. They didn't have an AR-15 in mind. That's, that's an interesting point. Yeah, because that's probably true. In the 1700s, they're like, "Well, when they had when you get muskets. that RPG, <laughs> so you have a they're using all this military. Yeah. Power. Man, when you get the uh, Sea Sparrow <laughs> missile, uh, we want to make sure that yeah. we bake this into the Constitution. Right. Uh, yeah. It's like, of course, of course not. But but obviously, weaponry and times and things change and the constitution it still accounts for i think those times we just have to be adaptable to it and but i still think it should be taken in a, in a still literal sense because the, the spirit of the second amendment is, is still pertinent and still germane to today even though the weaponry may have changed so the other argument that i also hear too as well is when when the founding fathers were talking about the first amendment of freedom of speech and freedom of religion were they thinking about Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, the internet. No. Yeah. I, I mean, I mean, to disseminate information, you had Paul Revere riding through the streets saying the redcoats are coming. Not, I'm just in a tweet to 75 million people. Yeah. Why well, things and times change. Yeah. So does that mean that we do away with the first and second amendments because? I don't know. They weren't thinking about Twitter at that time, or they weren't thinking about AR-15s like we see them today. Well, of course not. Yeah. But I wouldn't be fearful of Twitter or fearful of the evolution of weaponry. I would embrace it. Well, one and, and one of the things I think that it's germane to our society, it's inherent in everything that we do, Trust is important in our society. And it doesn't matter if you have a musket or if you have an AR-15 or if you have anything else. If it's in the hands of somebody that I don't trust, I'm very concerned. You're as concerned if it's a musket or if it's an AR-15. It, I, not as. I'm, I'm just concerned. You're just right? concerned. Right. Yes. And, and, and there's something that I, I oftentimes see in that in, in people – People don't realize how incredible it is every time you go in a restaurant and what it means about the society in which we live in. Every time you go in a restaurant, you could skip and not pay the bill. Every time. And nobody would stop you. Every time. You could act like you're going to the bathroom and then just like go skip in your out car and drive and you away. Can go to another, and you can go to another restaurant every day. You could and eat you can for get free fat doing that every day. Every single day, right? But there's this overarching umbrella in this country and it's in the constitution it's 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 our society that is rooted in trust now the problem is everybody is not trustworthy okay the tax that we pay for freedom is that the majority of the people who are trustworthy get the freedom but the people who aren't true or trustworthy get it too. And there are many people amongst us who are not good people who try to tear down the trust that we have in each other. That's what terrorism is. You know what's crazy too? It's a minority. Yeah. The reason why restaurants if still it operate a minority, they, they, no they, restaurant they, would be whatever, open. They make you well, they make you they pay, make you pay first. up front. Yeah. Yeah. They would make you pay up front. So why do we let the tail wag the dog in our society? Fear. Because of fear. Fear. That's why. And, and so it's interesting whether all of these arguments, I think, are rooted in there's this inherent trust that's in our society. And the problem with the dissension that's going on right now is we're tearing down that inherent trust of people. Exa you're exactly right. Right. Yeah. And we're tearing down that inherent trust of people because they think about things in a different way from us. 
And so when they think about different ways, things Let's go back to what you said in the beginning where fear of where the fear of being different. Yes. Yeah. So we try to dehumanize those who think about things in different ways because we're we're fearful of them. But it's this notion of tax. And you hear me talk about this all the time, the hater tax. And you probably hear me say the hater tax on every other podcast that we do. Uh, by definition, the Rendon Hunt hater tax is the more you do and the more impact you have, the more hate you're going to get. Yeah. Right? I saw it first. I saw it in the last two years. Just like the more money you make, the more taxes you're going to pay. This is a song, Rendon. It's a song. It's by Diddy. <laughs> Big is called Mo Money, Mo, Mo Problems. problems. <laughs> yes. So here's the thing. As a financial advisor, when I was a financial advisor in a former life, you'd always have the the slick operator trying to come in and talk about, I don't want to pay taxes, yada, yada, yada. I don't want. I was like, look, the best way, you, you do you really want to pay $0 in taxes? Yeah, yeah, I really want to pay $0. Don't make any money. Don't make any money. Done. <laughs> Next. You can leave my office now. That was easy. Yeah, it's like it's like coming to America. Yeah, when he caught when he cut off his ponytail, haircut, he cut off his ponytail. I want the real American haircut. You just cut next, <laughs> right? It's yeah. like it's like look, you don't. So if you don't want to have anybody hate on you, don't say anything. Don't say anything. Yeah, don't sit, do anything. Just sit down. Don't make a difference. You know, don't don't criticize anybody that's doing the wrong thing. Don't praise anybody who's doing the right thing. Just don't do anything. Just sit down and just. You know, chill. If you want to have an impact. You're going to have haters. You're going to have haters. It's the tax. And the bigger of an impact you have. The more haters. The more haters you're going to have. It's the hater tax. Okay. But that's one of those things that, that anybody who achieves, it's your Jeff Bezos comment, which I, which I think is, is spot on. Anybody who achieves and is willing to, to push the limit in any way, they're not afraid of the hater tax. Neither am I, and neither are you. No. I tell you what, I mean, there's going to be, there's, there's already haters, as we've discussed. They're out there, and they're out there in full force. Okay. Just like I said in the first episode that we had, the hater tax is, is there, it will always be there. But there's such a small percentage of the people that are hating compared to how many people have so much positive things to say yeah. about us and what we're trying to do here, that if I focused on the haters, I'd get nothing done. If I was scared or fearful of being hated on by a handful, then I would never get up in the morning and leave my house. You also have to recognize what the fear is, where the fear comes from, and is it even worth being scared of it? It's a personal assessment that everybody has to do on their own, but I think what we've discovered in our lives is that it's not that bad. Well, it starts with confronting it. Yes. It starts with confronting it. And we all have these pieces in our lives. We have these, these boogeymen that are there that are laying in the cut and waiting. And we have to confront them. It's those like things. us going to St. John's. And you know, you know, you always hear all the stories. You know, there's not very many black students there, and you know, it's not a diverse <coughs> environment, and you're not gonna, you're not gonna have any friends, and and you're not gonna get. Okay, we hear we hear all that. Well, that's not what happened to us at St. John's at all. We could have been fearful of that, and that could have stifled us from doing or even going to the school at all, or even staying. But we found some of the most dearest friends that we still love and adore today and they're white too by the way but we weren't scared of meeting people with humanity and not being fearful of what somebody looked like well even and then we challenged them even to accept us because i would probably venture to imagine that there was some trepidation or some fear there because we look different but they have the opportunity to overcome their friends, their fears, to befriend us too. Well, and that's the thing. And that's why, I mean, I even go back to the idea of nothing wrong with being afraid. Yeah. It's okay. There's yeah, nothing wrong with being afraid, man. It's okay. There is something wrong with allowing fear to run your life. There you go. But being afraid, 
I mean, look, I, it, it's there's this moment before every podcast. It's brief. And to your point, <clears throat> excuse me, I think the more you do stuff, the the better you get at it. But there's probably a 38-second moment I have before every podcast. 38, exactly. So you like that, don't you? <laughs> there's like a there's a brief moment where it's like a little bit of fear, a little bit of butterflies. Every one that, that, that goes by, it's less and less to the point where, you know, you just – but it's good to have that because it keeps you on edge, right? And that, that's what you were saying about kind of fear can fear can be good. It keeps you on edge. It doesn't prevent me from talking. It doesn't prevent me from being who I am. Nothing prevents you from talking. <laughs> <laughs> A muzzle made by Zeus himself couldn't Could prevent not you, stop from you from talking. talking. <laughs> <laughs> this guy shut up. <laughs> So you think is that voice of your hair talking to you? No, no, you're no, talking out you're loud. You're just talking to yourself. You're still talking. <laughs> stop stop, stop talking. talking. Is it still happening? Stop. It's happening again. Stop talking. <laughs> oh. We gotta wrap it up. But this again, for everyone listening, the, the, we want you to understand that we all have fears. I have fears. Brendan, you've articulated that very well. But the issue is it's not having them. It's about what you do about it. And ultimately, fear, in my opinion, it breeds courage. It does. It does. And I, I had a, a good friend who reached out to me and was giving me some feedback on the podcast. Does she wear socks? She. Does she wear socks? When it's appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> What do you want from me? What do you want from me? What do you want from me? <laughs> Fine. <laughs> uh, and, and she gave me some some really good feedback. And she said, you know, it's it's always interesting. She said, like, you know, have you guys thought about how you wrap up the podcast? I was like, no, nah, I mean, to, to your point about will you stop talking, it's kind of a long conversation. And, you know, then the guys in the, in the booth are like, shut up, cut it off, cut it off, cut it off. So uh, she was, she was, she was asked, she said, yeah, if there was something that you guys ended on, that would be really helpful. So I think it would be appropriate to end our podcast with a Willie Huntism. This is good. Yeah, Dad's full of those. With, 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 with Dad, Willie Hunt, what he used to have on our answering machine at 7655 Smiling Wood Lane. Mm -hmm. So I'll end, I'll actually let you say it, Wesley. I'll end with. And remember that smiles are contagious, so make someone's day. Do it. Thank you.